Hello and welcome to All Hands on Tech, where today's leaders talk tomorrow's technology. I'm Jeremy Morgan. Corey Quinn is one of the founders of the Duckbill Group. The Duckbill Group acts as a guide to navigating the murky waters of AWS. They help with reducing costs and even predicting future costs with your AWS infrastructure. Now, this requires an intimate knowledge of AWS and how to optimize it, as well as some good old fashioned business sense. Now, I follow Corey online and he's a very interesting character. I want to introduce you to him and shine some light on this fascinating work in our rapidly changing world. So let's welcome Corey Quinn. So how are you doing today, Corey? Oh, can't complain, given that there's a global pandemic on. Other than that, fair to Midland. Yourself? (laughs) Other than that, yeah, I'm doing great. So tell us a little bit about what you do and and what's a chief cloud economist. Oh, geez. So... At a high level, I go in to companies and I help them with their horrifying AWS bills. The easy way that people imagine that is that I make the bills smaller, which I do, but that's sort of a byproduct of what I really do, which is helping companies understand and predict what those bills are going to be. At least that's what it was like until a few weeks ago when suddenly we see this global event happening and suddenly people start caring about cutting the bill rather than understanding and predicting the bill. Uh, a lot more than they used to. Turns out that when suddenly everyone's belt tightening, actually saving money is once again in vogue. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Are you seeing a big shift in what you're doing with your company just in the last week or so? I would say everyone's seeing a bit of a big shift in that everyone is starting to figure out how to work in a way that we never had to work before, where suddenly everyone is remote, where We have much lower bandwidth conversations than we do in person, and suddenly everything is murky and uncertain. It used to be uh, a few short months ago that money was almost free. If you needed to raise additional investment, interest rates were low. It was very easy to go about getting additional funding. Now, with layoffs happening across the board, mass unemployment, we're seeing a very different dynamic play out. And it's still very early to identify specific trends, but we're definitely seeing a lot of renewed interest. Did you work remotely before or have you switched to remote? Oh, we've been uh, entirely distributed. My business partner lives up in Portland, Oregon. I live in San Francisco and we have staff scattered across all kinds of places. So we're about 10 people now. And I don't believe that any uh, two of us, well, that's not not fair. I don't believe that any more than um, three of us live in the same city. Okay. So could you tell us a little bit about the Duckbill Group and and what that is? Sure. It was, it started off uh, once upon a time as a bit of a lark. I was independent and everything I did as a company was sort of a thin wrapper around my crappy excuse for a personality where I have a newsletter last week in AWS that gathers the news from Amazon's cloud ecosystem and then gently and lovingly makes fun of it. And it was more or less a vehicle by which I could do consulting work. I wound up merging with a longtime friend of mine uh, about a little over a year ago now, and Mike Julian. He and I are now the co-owners of the company, and we've been on a bit of a hiring tear in recent months. But we go into companies in a pure advisory sense and help them understand, uh, reduce, and predict their AWS bills. We also have a media group that does the pod that does my newsletter and two additional podcasts, Screaming in the Cloud and the AWS Morning Brief, both of which are, well, sarcastic doesn't seem to quite go far enough. So we tend to call them snarky. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, I, I followed you on Twitter for a while and uh, that's that's one of the things I particularly enjoy is the amount of sm- snark. <laughs> Everyone loves kind of it until suddenly they find it aimed at them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And one of, one of the things that I kind of admire is like, okay, this person's in a business and he's making fun of everybody pretty much equally. That's That can often be what is perceived, but it's not technically true. If you take a look at the at how I view the rules of snark from uh, from how I, how I angle things. I don't call out individuals in almost any case because it doesn't go yeah. well. It's The rule is always punch up, not down. I make fun of large publicly traded companies, and that's generally fair game. I don't make fun of small, scrappy startups. That's why I own Twitterforpets.com. So I have a fake startup that I can make fun of without actually crapping on people's hard work. It's there's more nuance to it than uh, a lot of people would expect would expect. Yeah. So how did you get started in the cloud being involved in the cloud? So before creating this company? 
<laughs> I spent uh, almost 15 years as a grumpy Unix systems administrator originally, because it's not like there's a second kind of Unix administrator out there. And in time, I saw the world changing. Cloud became much more of a clear thing than it had been previously. And it was very obviously going to be this transformative force. I could either sit there, shake my fist and complain, continue writing Perl on Solaris, or I could evolve and I sort of stumbled my way through a, very, a variety of jobs uh, called SRE, DevOps, Production Engineer, Systems Engineer. It really depends on what company for the flavor du jour. But event, after I left my last full-time job, it was all right. I, I dabbled with consulting for a while, uh, on and off for years, usually for other companies. And I figured if I was going to try consulting one more time, what would I do differently to make it more viable? And the few things I came up with were, one, I would pick a problem that I would absolutely never be woken up about in the middle of the night because on call had basically burned me out. It was going to be an expensive business problem. And I could never charge by the hour because as soon as you start doing that, you are artificially capping how much revenue you're going to be able to bring in. There's only so many hours in the day. And what people don't expect when they start down the path of running their own business I spent probably 70% of my time in those first couple of years on client development, which means there wasn't a lot of time left in the day for coding. So what do you think prepared you for, for being so good at what you're doing now? So you mentioned being a Unix administrator. That one I could imagine certain things like scaling and provisioning and things like that were probably second nature, but... Well, you would think that, wouldn't you? But surprisingly, back in those early days, it was less of a problem because, oh, it was more capacity planning because, oh, we need to scale up. Great. I'm ordering some servers and they'll be here in six short weeks. Yeah, that that was that is yep. some very slow auto scaling behavior. Not quite as slow as Amazon some weeks, but, you know, close. <laughs> so did you have any crazy job before you were doing anything in tech? Oh, I, I did a few things here and there. It's a good question. Most people don't tend to think to ask that. I spent time as a corporate recruiter, which was bizarre and ridiculous. I was in sales for a while, selling tape drives into the AS400 market. Many moons ago, I, I did some moonlighting as uh, IT help desk support in Windows environments, a little bit of Windows admin work. And back in school, I put myself through school in the summers as a telemarketer for uh, slinging credit cards. The disturbing part oh. is I was good at it. Did you actually enjoy it? Oh, absolutely not. Uh, that's bothering people at dinner was super obnoxious. But it's you, you figure out a way to tell a story and articulate benefits and then get out of people's way. And you get very good at accepting rejection. Yeah, I could imagine. So do you think storytelling, do you think that skill comes into what you do now to where, you know, you can present a bunch of numbers, you can present a bunch of graphs, you could do things like that. Do you, do you find it easier if you can kind of create a story around, you know, here's where your company's at, here's where you're going. Everything is, comes down to storytelling. It doesn't matter what your job is. You, you are, there are two kinds of salespeople, people who know that they're selling something and people who don't. And everyone's in sales, whether they want to be or not. It comes down to selling a vision, selling an idea, selling a course of action. You want to build things a certain way? Well, you have to sell that idea to people who you work with. Telling business stories is something that a lot of people tend to forget is important. It's the same reason that you see the tired old trope of, well, I don't see the point of having a consultant come in. They're just going to say what I've been saying for years. Why would, why would, uh, why are we just going to throw money at them? Well, in some cases, because they know how to position that story with framing that resonates with the business. And something else that tended to surprise me early on is that people tend to value advice about as much as they've paid for that advice. And I've never had uh, more challenging work than when I did some volunteer work in the AWS billing space for a few large nonprofits. When people aren't paying for advice, they're not going to, to recognize it. So it, it comes down to charging commensurate to the value you deliver. That's something that I think a lot of people in business have not intuitively grasped. And it's not easy. I certainly didn't grasp it at all when I started this. It's one of those rapid education moments. Hmm. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. I think with software, it's much in the same way. I think the quality of software when, because I, I spent years as a, a software engineer and independent and in corporate, I found that the same thing. The more expensive the software was, the more organizations tend to trust it and value it. And it didn't seem to kind of tie to the quality as much as just the cost. You know, somebody would come in and 
and say, well, it's going to cost you a million dollars to build this. And, and, and then the, the perceived value there was that this must be amazing software. We paid a million dollars for it. Exactly. It, there's no, when people tend to make a buying decision or whether they're going to continue down a path, they go based upon signal. Uh, there are some services out there that you can't get any pricing information out of without filling out a form and waiting for a salesperson to call you. That tells you, A, it's going to be expensive, and two, that even to get a quick question answered or kick the tires on it, I've got to go through a whole sales process. Not interested personally in, in the general case. Conversely, yeah. if I wind up seeing something that is, oh, there are two tier, three tiers, $10, $20, and $30 a month, then for a lot of things, I'm not even going to begin to consider using that because if I'm looking to build something at significant scale, it's very clear that I would be one of their largest customers for some things that I would do. And you don't ever want to be the biggest customer of a particular company because at that point you wind up with some really weird and strange uh, side effects. So yeah, pricing is a big signal that I think people don't tend to realize that they're sending and even when we say that, oh, that stuff doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. We all make decisions based upon perceived value. Yeah, absolutely. What does the, the current landscape look like for your company and for what you're doing? Like, what are people talking about right now every day? There, across the board, industry-wide, there have been um, a lot of changes in a very short period of time when it just due to the cultural pandemic that we're experiencing and living through. These are historic times. But stepping back from that a second, the, the overall trend of people going towards microservices because they read it about that going with microservices was a good idea on Hacker News or maybe some thought leader on a stage said it somewhere and not really understanding the complexity and trade-offs you're making by going down that path has been fascinating. Uh, something we'll notice is that if someone goes all in on rolling their own Kubernetes and deploying that on top of a cloud provider, well, great, you have 100 applications running in those Kubernetes clusters, but your cloud provider sees a single application called Kubernetes. So it's very challenging to do any form of allocation of which application is the expensive one. It's just this one really weird a monolith from the cloud provider perspective. So allocating what's the misbehaving app that's doing a lot of data transfer, there are no tools that solve for those problems today. You've got to do an awful lot of manual spelunking. So that's been a subject of some concern in our space. We also, in the, in the more macro sense, away from the economic side, there's been the ongoing discussion about cloud providers and is multi-cloud a good idea? Do you pick one provider and go all in? And everyone has opinions on these, but it's easier to sound off on what you believe other people should be doing than it is to understand that the answer to those questions is generally nuanced and complex. It, it comes down in many respects to like the, the microcosm of our entire uh, our entire industry function in which we generally tend to provide marriage counseling between finance and engineering. So what role does tech skills play in all of this? So I'm imagining what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, and I imagine you have to know a ton about AWS, for instance. And that is, you know, such a huge landscape. Like we could spend the rest of this podcast naming off AWS services. And Oh, and I could easily start naming ones that don't exist. And who in the world could call me out on that? Even AWS employees can't keep up. <laughs> exactly. How important are tech skills and, and keeping up with some of the services in AWS, for instance, for the people yeah, in the That group. has been one of the ongoing challenges for us. It's What's strange is that because we tend to focus, by and large, on understanding and reducing large bills, it's less important than you might expect. As much as we want to talk about all the 200 services, not an exaggeration, that AWS offers, there are really only five to 10 that are the significant cost drivers that we see across the board. Sure, you'll see something esoteric and odd from time to time, but it's EC2, S3, RDS, and a few others that are the basically the big fundamental building blocks of how these things work. Sure, it's nuanced and it's challenging and there's a heck of a learning curve, but these are patterns and they tend to repeat. The first time you spend two weeks on something trying to tease out an answer, it's maddening and it takes forever and requires an incredibly deep technical dive. The second time you see it, it takes about seven seconds to understand what's going on and you look like a wizard from the future. 
definitely a good way to approach it. Do you do any kind of like personal projects or anything with AWS to learn, you know, new features of a new service or? Oh, constantly. I spin things up on an ongoing basis. The way that I learn is that I tend to see what they say about a new service that they've just launched. And then I start looking for things that they've gotten wrong or things that are not well documented. And the way I've discovered those things is by building something myself. That's easier to do with some services like a new uh, a new Lambda function runtime than it is other services like Ground Station, a service that talks to satellites in orbit. It turns out it's really, really expensive to launch a satellite on short notice. So what would you recommend to somebody who, say, if someone had their site set on your group and they said, this is something that's great and awesome and I want to be a cloud economist, what would you suggest would be a good way for them to start? First, I don't think I've ever met anyone who said, I want to be a cloud economist. It's something that happens to you rather than something (laughs) you aspire to do, in my experience. But it comes down as well to finding things that identify with how people learn best. Some folks are terrific at learning through reading or through guided in, uh, classroom instruction style or through video. I'm terrible at those things. I can, those things go in one ear and out the other for me. So the way I learn best is by building something myself. If that's if that resonates with someone, I encourage them to pursue that. Find a relatively short project that you can start playing with a service you don't fully understand and see what happens. I mean, that's how I learned things like DynamoDB. I had to build something to solve a particular problem I was facing. And a week later, I now know more than I ever wanted to about Dynamo, just because now that I've actually worked with it, I have a much keener understanding than reading any number of books on the subject. Yeah, that's pretty cool. What are some common misconceptions that people might have about what you do? People tend to assume from the outside that all I'm going to do is come in and do a bunch of analysis with some scripts and dump the output into a binder and throw it over the wall. If that's where what I, if that is what I did, I would not be doing this in a consulting capacity. I would have built a software as a service product. The the trouble is, is that there's no API for business insight. This stuff is all contextually bound and people think, Oh, you're competing with all of those class, those uh, cloud platform uh, management tools out there. No, I'm not. Uh, my, most of my customers are using at least one of them. And from that perspective, what we're doing is not tied to any particular tool or any particular uh, API call that we wind up making. I mean, sure, there's some of that that goes into it to inform our analysis, but it really is about understanding what the customer pain is and what the customer need is. I mean, the first question I always ask on a sales call when someone says our AWS bill is too high is great. Why do you care? Well, yeah, it's a valid question. Which sounds ridiculous and naive, and why would you be asking me that question? And sometimes the answers are illuminating. Well, because my company is spending $80,000 a month on uh, this cloud environment, but it could be spending 40000 a month. Cool. Uh, how many engineers are working on that thing? 50. Cool. So they're embezzling more in office supplies every month than they're spending on cloud services. Good, good. <laughs> Let's take it a step beyond that. What, what did your boss say when you talked to them? Oh, they said it wasn't important. Build this feature. Okay, what are you actually building? Oh, it's an experiment. And if it works, we're going to capture a uh, giant opportunity. And if not, we'll shut that thing down in six months. Yeah, the reason no one cares is because it's not an expensive problem. You can always cost optimize things better than they are, but you don't need to do that on day one. If you set up If you set out today trying to build something for the least possible amount of money, you're almost certain to fail. Build something, see if it's possible, see if it works, and then optimize later. And in time, you'll let, you'll see costs creeping up again, and then it's time for another optimization pass. It's not something that you're going to solve by getting everyone building these things to understand costing in a nuanced way. And I'd argue you shouldn't. Hmm. Yeah. And and that actually brings me to another question I was going to ask you is, do you come into a company and spend a set amount of time and say, okay, now that we fixed everything and we've set you on a good path, it was great working with you. See you later. Or is it more of an ongoing relationship um, where there is a constant need to come back in and, and optimize things? Both. Uh, we have some very long-term retainer customers and we have some that are effectively after a quick hit of, we need to cut the bill immediately. We don't particularly care how and then get out of here. We don't want to see you anymore. Most tend to be somewhere in the middle of those uh, those two extremes. It really comes down to customer pain and customer need. It's 
Sometimes it's very short period uh, time frame, such as negotiating a new contract. Other times it's a much longer term story as far as ongoing allocation and continuing to provide insight to the larger business side of the world uh, from engineering, acting as a bridge between them. It really tends to depend. Okay. What does the future look like for AWS, in your opinion? Is, do you see their services getting bigger and more complex and kind of spreading out? Or Well, I don't see them going the other direction. I mean, their product strategy is, uh, is effectively the word yes. There's, <laughs> there's very little that I would say they wouldn't get into. And they are famous for not turning things off, uh, as opposed to Google, whereas turning things off is a core competency. The problem that that leads to is that anything that they build is more or less going to be around forever. So while that does cause sprawl and complexity and then some, I also would have no reservations about building a business on top of any ridiculous service that they happen to launch on the AWS side, because I know it's going to be around longer term. Yeah. So I guess that is a optimistic way of looking at it. Most of the people that I've asked about AWS services, that's usually what they say is if you sit and stare at the console long enough, you'll see new ones pop up as you're there, you know, basically. Yeah. And the trick to remember is that every service is for someone, but no, sir, but no service is for everyone. There's always going to be things that wind up uh, evolving and it's easy to look at that and get overwhelmed. But if you're eyeing getting started with the world of cloud, there are maybe five to 10 services that you need to understand. And that's really about it to land your first job in the space. The rest of it you learn as you go. The problem is, is one of those services, for example, is EC2. They run a virtual instance as a system uh, a product where you can just spin up a bunch of virtual computers. Terrific. They're, it's incredibly complicated. It's incredibly nuanced and deep. And by the time you finally learn enough about that to be dangerous, you're, oh my God, there's 190 other services that they all must be this bad. They're not. That is probably the most complicated service or pretty close to it. And it's one of the first things people encounter. One of the others is IAM, their security permissions model. Great. That's also stupidly complex. And you wind up hitting a lot of the complexity up front, which in turn means that you tend to believe that the entire space is like this. It's really not. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time with IAM and a lot of frustration with it. And I actually re- very recently experienced exactly what you're talking about. So I worked a lot with IAM and S3 and things like that. A lot of these things were really complicated. So I needed to spin up just a really small web server to host my website for a little while until I figured out what I was going to do with it. So I was expecting, you know, light sale. I'd heard about it and I'm like, I'll try out light sale. And I, I'm sure this is going to be a complicated mess. So I'm going to set aside a few hours to do this and and I was pleasantly surprised that within 15 minutes, I had this Unix server, little FreeBSD server up and running, grab my SSH keys, jump in and was able to do everything I needed to do. I was also expecting, OK, here's this big, complicated permission structure. And I was expecting a lot more and was pleasantly surprised by LightSail in particular. Yes. And uh, the networking stuff is the VPC stuff is almost incomprehensible the first few times you see it. And that's something you have to smack into too to get a a EC2 instance up and running. It feels like LightSail is very much a reimagining of it. Uh, EC3, if you will. It's a glimpse of a future we could have had, but didn't. Yeah. And I know that it's EC2 running in the background. So it kind of seems like it was probably an interface more than anything. Like LightSail is just an interface. Well, we saw this before, back when I first started with this, I think I want to say 2010 or so. Rightscale was a company before they disappeared into oblivion, was that, that all they did was they wrapped EC2 and provided a window interface, a dashboard that a human being could understand. Because back then you had to pick which kernel you were going to run, which uh, there was a whole RAM uh, disk style. There was an init RD that you had to wind up worrying about. It was incredibly complicated and nuanced if you'd never done it before. And their entire business value was they added a bit of fee on top and then you just got the click to receive instance. Now, the problem with building a product like that is that AWS services don't generally tend to get worse over time, they get better. And as it became more and more straightforward to do these things without a third party, the value they added became less and less. We see this with a lot of people building tools around the AWS space and the cloud space in general, where this is a hard problem, so we're going to make it better. Well, if your business can be eviscerated by a few feature releases from the cloud provider, 
you don't have a particularly unassailable position and you need to be aware of that and have contingency plans and a path towards evolving. With everything that I do, the rounding up of AWS's news, the snark of making fun of them, the cost optimization stuff, I've had conversations with people about AWS along all three of those axes and given them various blueprints for how to put different aspects of what I do out of business. And I'm hoping that they'll do it, and I really, at some point, think that they need to, for at least two of those. I don't think they're ever going to get really good at making fun of themselves uh, to the level that I make fun of them. But then again, they, with a straight face, named a service Systems Manager Session Manager. So maybe I'm wrong on that. <laughs> they Maybe they're going to be better at self-mockery than I am at mocking them. Did they really do that? They, oh, yes. AWS <laughs> Systems Manager Session Manager. It is, it's a terrific uh -oh. service with a stupid name. What it functionally does is it winds up popping up a web console where you are now effectively staring at a terminal inside of an EC2 instance. The thing that people have always wanted uh, doesn't use SSH. It winds up hooking under the hood to an agent running on these things. It's a great service. It's free. It provides a way for people to shut off SSH across the board to their systems, but still have a backdoor in in case something breaks and they really need to fix it. It's audited, it uses IAM permissions, and you can have every command that gets typed in logged to Cloud Trailer S3. So the service is awesome. The name is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, that's actually, that sounds like a pretty cool service, but... It's one of those many services and subservices that people don't know tend to exist. But that's the sort of thing that just by mentioning that off the top of my head in conversations with this, someone listening to this is going to sit bolt upright from that description and say, wait a minute and learn that this exists. And, so, and suddenly it potentially changes their workflow. And that's the entire point. Everyone has those moments. Every, people think, oh, I must know everything about every AWS services, every, every, every AWS service out there. Hell no, I have no idea how some of these things work under the hood. And the way that I learn these things is I, I and this is the trick that I think most people lose sight of, I thrive on being the dumbest person in the conversation where I am thrilled to ask the dumb idiot question that everyone knows the answer to because one of two things happens. One, it turns out that I'm not asking a dumb question and other people have the same question. So now, oh, good, it's not just me. And then we can start working to find an answer together and start yelling at the right people. Or it is a dumb question. There's this stupid, easy, right answer. Someone says it. I didn't know it worked that way. It corrects something I didn't know. And now I have that. I've never I've never regretted asking the question that I or saying I don't know. In fact, when I was hiring, one of the biggest indicators I looked for when interviewing for senior people was how willing they were to admit they didn't know something. The worst, everyone says that giving a wrong answer in the uh, in an interview is um, is a terrible sin. But the, they're right to some extent, but the, the right answer is I don't know, but if I had to guess. And then speculate wildly. If you get it right, it shows your instincts are spot on. If you get it wrong, no one's going to hold it against you and you're showing how your mind works. But if you are authoritatively wrong about something, spoiler, in a job interview scenario, if someone's asking you a technical question, they probably know the right answer. You're not going to be able to bluff. Yeah, absolutely. And that's always great advice uh, to give for people who are, are doing technical interviews. I've, oh, I've yes. written a lot about that recently and, and even over the years spending time as a hiring manager. And oh, yeah. One of my favorite talks that I gave was on salary negotiation about a year ago with Sonia Gupta. She and I gave a team talk at DevOps Day Charlotte. Hmm. The And that was a lot of fun. I love talking about salary negotiation, about how to handle technical interviews, about how to handle the job interview process because I got really good at it because one of my primary skills as an employee was getting fired a lot. So I got a lot of practice <laughs> and now it's great. All of that was super helpful and now useless because I'm not going to work anywhere because I'm basically unemployable. So running my own company is out there. I did take a lot of that into consideration when designing how we handle compensation, how we handle the process of interviewing people for various roles here. And it's it turns out you can get surprisingly far by treating people how you wanted to be treated. Uh, as a manager, I found that I get surprisingly far as well by looking at some of the managers that I've had in the past and then doing the exact opposite of what they did. Absolutely. <laughs> and you wouldn't think that would be as effective a management strategy as you would want it to be, but it works disturbingly well. 
Yeah, absolutely. I could definitely see that. Uh, what do you think of, of whiteboard interviews for developers? Well, certainly better than waterboard interviews. <laughs> the problem that I see with whiteboard interviews is that it's generally a skill that people tend to trot out only during job interviews. It is not representative of how most people solve problems. When I write code, I don't know about you. The first thing I do is I go to my preferred editor, which is called Stack Overflow. <laughs> then I use the copy and paste functionality. And there we go, because I am indeed a full Stack Overflow developer. The problem is, is that now draw this thing out on a whiteboard. First, that's not a coding environment anyone is comfortable in. There's no syntactic sugar and you feel dumb. Two, for the person interviewing you, it's any random Thursday, but for you, your entire career hangs in the balance and you're now performing in front of someone. It is incredibly stressful and even outages where you're desperately trying to fix them don't have that same kind or level of stress. Also, surprise, not everyone is terrific at interviewing skills and presenting like that and that's not a skill you generally tend to use in your day-to-day -day work. So I have a whole host of problems with that. I think that people tend to get job interviews wrong across the board. I, one of the things I like to ask is instead of me finding something you're weak on so I can just kick the living crap out of you over it, that doesn't serve anyone. Inst that's trying to hire for absence of weakness, and I hate the model. Instead, what are you best at? What If I could ask you a deep technical question about something, what area would you want that to be? What can I do that lets you shine at the thing that you're best at? And when you give people a chance to do that, they really will surprise you. Hmm. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting approach. I'm also very conflicted on take-home interviews where it's because it tends to bias for people who have a bunch of spare time to spend working on your problem. Uh, the thing that I absolutely despise has been take-home interviews that are very clearly something that they want to throw into production. <laughs> it's yeah. like effectively taking projects to Upwork, except it's free. You just have 15 different interview candidates, build different components of it, and then stitch it all together. I hate that model. Yeah, I, I've never actually seen that. So I, as a manager, I have given take-home interviews, but I uh, I never did it for them to build a feature. But is, is that something that you've actually seen happen? I mean, I've, I've heard of it happening, but... I can't prove... I, I've never been... I've never worked at a company that did it because, you know, I, I tend to at least pick companies that are yeah. not outright unethical, at least in that way. And But I've... I've as a candidate, I'll never forget one where they had this random Java app sitting on GitHub and they wanted me to build a fully working CI, CD pipeline and monitoring system for this inside of an EC, of an AWS account that they spun up and do the whole thing so it can be run with one script from the ground up. And there were a few other requirements in there. And I remember this because I got, I started working on it. It took me two full days. And at the end of it, there were still fundamental problems with how the application was built that it was very clear that no one had actually actually solved this problem yeah. or I was just far worse than everyone else in the space. I finally got it working and then declined to submit it because at that point I had such a bad taste in my mouth that it was not worth pursuing. Yeah, absolutely. I could definitely understand that. Cause it was, this is why I love toy problems. Yeah, a toy problem I love to ask people was, uh, are you familiar with tiny URL, a URL shortener? And the, the, what I like about that is the answer is either yes, or if the answer is no, you can explain in 30 seconds what that is to someone. It takes a long URL and spits out a unique short URL. There we go. And then I want people to design that however they want, put that on a whiteboard. Let's have a conversation with the architecture looks like. Architect, uh, whiteboards are great for architecture discussions, lousy for writing code. Cool. Now it goes by six months later. It's slow. Now what? Where is it getting slow? Find the bottleneck. Cool. Now I want it to be multi-site. Now I want it to be active-active across three sites. If I kill one of these sites, what happens? What technologies do you build this on? And there are no wrong answers there. It lets me see how people think, and it lets me see how people respond to being challenged on some of their architectural decisions, respectfully, of course. And it lets me see how things work. And that leads to great conversations. And... In some cases, some spectacularly wrong answers. One of the best bad answers I ever got was, um, I wouldn't do, I would never build that thing because that's a stupid thing to do. And I don't do stupid things. Uh, and so I go back and forth with this person three or four times. And at the end, like, it's a toy problem. Work with me. There says, I don't know. I guess I'd Google it. <laughs> Thank you. I have no further questions. Yeah. Cause nothing says yeah. bad interview like short interview. 
interview horror stories. And again, these, it's, it's, it feels a little sad to be dunking on people who are bad at interviewing just because otherwise it becomes this really unfortunate story of going too far towards punching down. Not everyone's good at interviewing, and that's kind of the point. Now, you want people to be able to collaborate with you and be and work in a professional environment, but not everyone needs to be an incredibly polished presenter in front of groups in order to excel at jobs that do not require that skill. Yeah, actually, that's really If good. you are good at that and you're terrific at doing it, great. By all means, find ways to showcase that. But that's why it comes down to being so important to meet candidates where they are. Yeah, and I think the the agile movement and having to do demos quite a bit has helped engineers in particular with that. Um, I've worked at organizations where we had to produce something every two weeks to demo to stakeholders. And so that made us better at demoing things and better at talking about things. So, of course, to the next job interview, you know, you go to and there's several people sitting around and you're like, oh, I'm going to demo something that I've built like I've done every two weeks for the last five years or whatever. So I, I think that has kind of helped because at least in my experience, engineers aren't generally the the type of people that are very outgoing and very focused on presentation skills and things like that. But I think possibly the agile movement might have helped in that a little bit. I, that always that always true. The, the challenge is, is the ones who are tend to wind up finding themselves pulled in other directions pretty quickly. I think that's where DevRel came out of. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So do you have any projects you're working on right now that you could tell us about? Nothing that is hugely relevant to most folks. There's uh, the entire newsletter that I send out every week has an entirely custom production system. The last time I did the numbers, it had 27 different Lambda functions behind four API gateways, two Dynamo DB tables, and a few other things. But that's mostly a uh, technology testbed, but also solves a real business problem. Nice. So that's been fun. I'm debating how much of that I want to open source down the road. It's been terrific for building conference talks. And if that's something that people ever wind up doing again, that might, that's going to give me fertile material to continue having conversations for years. But right now, as far as public work goes, not as much. Right. And so you have a couple of podcasts you mentioned. Did, did you want to talk about those? Sure. Screaming in the Cloud is a non-snarky, serious interview style show similar to this one, where I have a different guest every week and I have a discussion about what it is they're working on, how it works. Uh, guests have ranged from an intern at Facebook all the way up to the head of Azure and most folks in between. It's non-specific to any particular technology or approach. And the topic is business in the cloud. The other one is the AWS Morning Brief, which is slowly turning into a five-day-a-week morning show where it is incredibly sarcastic, cynical, and snarky. And mostly at the moment is monologue style, but that may be changing in the near future just because I want an opportunity to be cynical and sarcastic, but an interview show with different guests every week is not the venue for that. If people don't know what they're getting into. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, those are some of my favorite things, but yeah, in an interview, it might be tough. If you were going to name an AWS service, what would you name it and why? Oh, that's an interesting one. See, it's way easier for me to go ahead and make fun of existing names than it is to name things. I have proposed services that they build to various teams there and given them stupid names for them, but it would all come down to what the service did. Um, A URL shortener. It really depends. I mean, there's the cynical answer. There's the snarky answer. Uh, my rules for naming are it has to be something you can Google. Uh, they have a new service called HTTP APIs. Yeah, good luck Googling that term. Other things are great, like AWS Fargate. You can Google that super easily, but you have no idea what that is from the name. The right answer is usually somewhere between the two. But I might hire a new systems manager, marketing manager. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for, for talking with me today. No, thank you for having me on. It is always a pleasure. So that concludes our interview with Corey Quinn. You can find him online at Quinny Pig on Twitter, at lastweekinaws.com, or check out his podcast, Screaming in the Cloud. Thank you for listening to All Hands on Tech. If you like it, please rate us. You can see episode transcripts and more info at pluralsight.com slash podcast.